Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family and readers. Dick and I are joined again. With uh, We're working with Bill Blum, as usual, to give us the lowdown on what's happening with the Supreme Court. Uh, Bill is a former judge and death penalty defense attorney. He's the author of three legal thrillers that are published on Penguin 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 Partner. Um, they are Prejudicial Era, The Last Appeal, and The Face of Justice. Hey, Bill, good to see you. Good to see you again. So you have a piece that you have allowed us to publish on the LA Progressive, which uh, is reposted courtesy of Truth Dig. And um, we're calling it the John Roberts Blueprint for Imperial Presidency. Let's talk. What is John Roberts doing to us now? Well, John Roberts is doing a number of things. And I think it's significant that John Roberts wrote the immunity decision in the case of Trump versus the United States. This is the case that arises out of special counsel Jack Smith's election subversion prosecution centered on the um, effort to overturn the 2020 election. The Supreme Court waited until July 1 to issue its opinion. It was the last opinion released, I believe, for the entire term. Usually the court uh, will release all of its opinions by the end of June, and um, it waited until the very last day. So the opinion, as most people know by now, uh, gives Donald Trump and arguably future presidents absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for actions taken uh, pursuant to what they call their core constitutional powers. Those are the powers of the president under Article II of the Constitution, such powers as commanding the military, issuing pardons, uh, naming ambassadors, appointing justices of the Supreme Court. And then the decision grants Trump and future presidents presumptive immunity for all official acts. Those, uh, that presumption can be overcome by proof that the prosecution at hand doesn't impinge on the authority of the presidents of the presidency, but it's a strong presumption in favor again of immunity. And then the uh, opinion uh, distinguishes or tries to distinguish official acts from unofficial acts. The opinion doesn't really come up with a definition of unofficial acts, unfortunately. Uh, in her concurring opinion, Amy Coney Barrett basically says what common sense would tell us that an unofficial act under this kind of classification system would be a personal or private act. Uh, it's mentioned in the majority opinion that uh, actions taken as a candidate might fall into unofficial conduct. Unofficial conduct doesn't get any immunity. So the, the decision says that uh, the president isn't above the law, but we have to have a strong presidency. It argues that the founding fathers wanted an energetic presidency. And because of that, the president has to be absolutely immune from actions undertaken pursuant to his constitutional powers and presumptively immune for all official acts. This is the first time the court has said that. And in fact, if uh, you want to look at the founding era, the better argument is that the founding fathers believed that the president <laughs> would be held criminally liable for official acts and unofficial acts. But this court flips that script and really does usher into being a uh, kind of monarchical presidency now and going forward. So it's a very dangerous decision. And the fact that it was written by John Roberts, as I argue in the piece, exposes John Roberts, the institutionalist, as a complete myth. That's just hogwash. John Roberts is the leader of a reactionary judicial junta, which is hell-bent on rolling back voting rights, civil rights, women's rights, and now I'm promoting an imperial presidency. So it's a very dangerous decision. It's a 6-3 decision with the liberals in the court, uh, basically powerless to stop this juggernaut from going forward. And uh, we're now in very dangerous uh, position. 
where if reelected, Donald Trump can use these four powers to do a whole bunch of things that we would previously have thought no president could get away with. Now, I do want to say one other thing, uh, that is that this decision doesn't expand the powers of the president. In other words, it, it's been said and said in, in, in the dissent by Sonia Sotomayor that the president can order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate uh, political opponents. That's true. But murder would still be murder. The difference is that Trump or a future president could not be prosecuted for that crime. However, because the pardon power, and this is one of the enumerated powers, is a core power, what a president could do is farm out that task to others and then pardon them. So it opens the door to wide-ranging conspiracies. The people who would carry out these nefarious deeds wouldn't be individually immune, but they would be immune by virtue of a pardon that the president would dispense to them and since pardoning is a core power, that the exercise of that power could not be reviewed by the courts. So it's really a crazy decision. And it's very hard to understand because some of these concepts that are discussed in the decision are phrased in the most opaque language. Like, uh, what is an unofficial act? Well, you might say it's a private act. But John Roberts says it's one which is not palpably within the scope of the authority of the presidency. Why not just say it's a it's a private act? Yeah. So I, I have a question. Um, so the United States uh, or the Supreme Court has existed for over 200, let's say about 240 years. Um, it's been 248 years since 1776, but it took a while uh, for the Supreme Court and for the United States to, to come to where it is in its current state. What I don't understand is what justification did he give to, to say, basically what he's saying is that um, the separation of powers mandates immunity and that without presidential immunity, the executive branch would be unable to, to do what they need to do. Well, wh what have they been doing for over 200 years? Why is it that it wasn't until now that the president must have immunity in order to take on bold and hesitating action. They completely avoid that real world question. They do recognize that this is the first time a former president has been prosecuted. And then the rationale is, as you said, separation of powers and the need to have a president who can take bold action and who will not be looking over his shoulder at his successor to, um, decide whether he'll be prosecuted for his crimes while in office. But they really do overlook and sweep under the rug the real world considerations about the dangers of a rogue, malignant narcissist like Donald Trump, whose objective is to seize power and keep power. And so you have to ask, are these justices naive? Are they ivory tower? intellectuals divorced from reality? The answer, I think, is no. These are really savvy political operatives. They've, they have they all have uh, political histories, including, of course, John Roberts and Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. These are, these are political activists. They know exactly what they're doing. Now that they have the power to do it, we're seeing all this unfold. And the lip service to no one being above the law is just that. Yeah, so uh, I mean, this is remarkable. So the the, the right wingers, the Republicans, uh, the Trumpskis are riding high now, and maybe they will be far into the future. But at some point, the worm is likely to turn, and and uh, a president will will come and take bold action in a direction these particular former Republican operatives don't like. Uh, I don't know that that's a question, but it seems like a, certainly a possibility some decades down the road. Well, that's a possibility. But another possibility is that armed with this sort of power and having the courts, the current court, totally on his side, Donald Trump can take further actions to prevent future transitions of power 
to progressive and liberal presidents. So it may be that this is just the, the first big step towards the complete transformation of the American political and legal system into what uh, people like Timothy Snyder from Yale warn is a form of American fascism. Snyder says that when you have the courts on your side, you have um, basically the door open to fascism. And that's what we really have to worry about now. How do we hold uh, this court accountable? And I think the only way you do it is to hold them accountable politically, which gets us into another entire t new topic, which is uh, what's happening with the uh, Democrats and the presidency and the implosion of the Biden uh, campaign. And are we going to be stuck with Joe Biden? And if we are, how do you convince people who have very short memories that uh, a vote for Biden would be, in, in effect, a vote against Trump, even more than a vote for Biden? You know, there are a lot of people, and I see them interviewed on TV, who say that, well, Donald Trump will be better handling the economy. Look at what it was under Trump. And they forget the year 2020. It's almost as though that year has been erased from their memories. So there's a lot of work to be done between now and November. And I think that groundswell is building, as we can see, to replace Biden with someone else. And I think that there are several people who can beat Donald Trump. And we have to see the election in existential terms like this. And the Supreme Court just provides another lens through which to see this upcoming election. And it really is the most important election in our lives. So so I, I am indeed the glass half full guy. And I thought the Biden meltdown was actually a gift. Uh, everybody with eyes in their heads and, and, and two brain cells in their head knew that Joe Biden is, it's not that he's too old, it's that he's fading mentally and physically. There are people older than him, take Bernie's Bernie, Bernie Sanders, who are plenty sharp, but he's not. And That's if right. he and if he stayed in the race, the whole conversation would be how how badly is he doing? What's he stumbling on? I, I believe he would lose. I believe he would take both houses of Congress down with him. I believe we would lose some some governorships, perhaps, and we'd be in a dreadful, dreadful place. And we'd be in even even worse place with the Supreme Court. And I I think what has happened is he this stumble has forced the issue. And I believe I believe they say Kamala Harris is not popular enough, but she hasn't really run as the as the leader. Uh, and I understand that there are people hate her. I mean, why would they not? She's black. She's a daughter of immigrants. She's an attractive young woman. She's California. What's not to hate? But I think that if if the Democrats really get scared of Trump, as they should, and get behind her, that's the only way we can we can back up the Supreme Court. She, as she's say. actually polling. She's polling pretty well against right. Trump in the surveys, the, the few that have come out in the last week. So I, I agree with you. I think she can beat Trump, but um, we have to see whether uh, the Democrats, whether the people who really control this party are going to, to have a heart to heart with Biden. Uh, you know, he said only the almighty can get me to uh, resign now to but step how, down. But how, how screwy is that? He doesn't own this. Screwy. He doesn't own this country. Yes, he, he does. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't get to make we that decision. To we gave it to him because the people don't stand up and demand something different. And as long as they don't, he can say that. He can say it, but he doesn't own the presidency. So we have to we have to demand that he uh, that he be replaced. That's right. Not because we dislike him. He did a lot of really good things domestically, but because it's the country's future that is the issue, not whether. Joe Biden, as he told George Stephanopoulos, uh, really gives it his all, and that's all that counts. That is nonsense. This is not a basketball game. This is the future of the country. That's right. Well, and he only gives it his all till 8 p.m. when he needs to, to tuck <laughs> in and go to bed. Yeah. That's right. I mean, what kind of president is that? I mean, it's a difficult job. You can't be napping and, and going to bed. Right. Yeah. You can't have Putin reading you bedtime stories. Well, this is an, another um, argument for people becoming engaged. We cannot have a democracy unless people are participating. There's no such thing as armchair quarterbacks 
um, having a say. You've got to get in there, get involved. You've got to vote. You've got to write to the editor. You've got to volunteer. You cannot sit on the sidelines now. Right. Especially you need to agitate within your political circles. If you belong to a Dem club, if you know a Congress. Well, I can't imagine a woman who is of childbearing age not being engaged right now. You see what happened with Roe v. Wade, how easily they overturned it. And, and it looks like it was easy. But the truth of the matter is that the far right has been working on this for 40 years. And the Democrats sure. should should have been prepared um, to make it so that wouldn't happen. But they didn't. That's right. This is the uh, this is the twelfth round, and we got to get ready to come out over the corner. That's right. Well, Bill, thank you once again for another really insightful, enlightening, educational um, chat with us. And the next time, let's let's do something that has a little bit more levity, a little comedy. So, okay. <laughs> See, I'll, I'll, I'll search around for that. All right. Okay. Bye, bye. Thanks Bill. so much. Bye, bye. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.